that the First World War had ended. He changed a few lines and soon Kate Smith on her radio program began to sing it. It became America's anthem during the Second World War. The opening lines are rarely heard anymore. Kate Smith would always sing them on her program. The opening lines to God Bless America are these. While the storm clouds gather far across the sea, let us swear allegiance to a land that's free. Let us be grateful for a land so fair as we raise our voices in this solemn prayer. God bless America. The song was sung spontaneously on the Capitol steps after the 9-11 attack. It was sung at the many memorials and prayer meetings across our nation in the days following uh, when the towers fell. Not far from here in northern Fort Bend County in Mercer Stadium in Sugarland, a large crowd gathered on the Friday night after the towers fell. They sang this song, and then the preacher got up, pastor of the largest Methodist church in the United States, Kirby John Caldwell. And he said, I love that song, and I appreciate that song, and I'm glad we sang that song. But the question tonight is not, will God bless America? God has already blessed America. The question tonight is, will America bless God? So my prayer tonight is not so much that God bless America. My prayer tonight is this. America, will you bless God? Will you turn your eyes toward the heavens that's been so good to this wonderful country? And will you lift your faces to glory and say, God, we would not have come this far we would not be who we are had not the guiding providential hand of the divine been upon us. Had not your provenient grace gone before us. Had we not seen the miracles that if you cannot read American history without seeing the hand of God. I challenge you to read about our revolution, uh, revolutionary war. I challenge you to read about how the little uh, ragtag fledgling Continental Army time and time again was up against the wall. And then a fog bank would come in. The rain would start. Winter snow would fall. And each and every time the founding father of our country would fall to his knees and say, but for God doing this, we would all be destroyed. I believe that America is at a crossroads. Now, we faced crossroads before, but never so stark and pivotal as the one we're facing right now. Other crossroads led our forefathers to the founding of this nation. Others led to the uh, eradication of slavery. Others led to the manifest destiny and to the spreading democracy around the world. And those crossroads defined and refined this idea of America. But the one we face right now, this crossroads where we stand right now, is not for the refining or defining. It is for the saving of America. This crossroads is like one we've never faced before. Because it's not a question of we go left or we go right or we go straight. It's a matter of salvation or destruction, exaltation or annihilation. I believe America has one revival left. I believe there's one overwhelming flood of the Spirit that is going to surge over this country. The number one mission outpost in the world today is not China, it is not a, a country in Africa, it is not a country down in Central or South America. The country that needs God the most is the one we're in right now. America is the number one mission field of the world. I believe that the Spirit of God is coming upon this nation. I believe there's going to be the greatest revival this world has ever seen because America has been the greatest missions giver in all of the planet. I know God doesn't owe us anything, but I believe that God is going to bless America one more time. So my admonition is, come on, America. Come on, churches. Come on, saints of God. It's time to bless the Lord. Oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. 
and all that is within me uh, bless his. Let's do that a little while here tonight. Let's bless the Lord together in this building. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. It was while visiting Turkey in the year of 2009, uh, President Obama uh, made a statement that really caused a lot of concern in the press, and it was debated and hashed and rehashed. He, he said in a meeting um, that we have a large Christian population in the United States, but we do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. And uh, that was not... That was not by accident earlier when he was a senator. He said, and he actually misquoted this line, the text of his speech and the way he said it, it was, it was misquoted. He said, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation, at least not just. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, a nation of non-believers. Now, I'm not going to put words in the president's mouth, and I'm not going to debate the president in absentia here tonight. But it seems to me that he believes that we were once a Christian nation, but we are no longer. I, 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 I don't know if I can give an answer to that. I don't know. I don't know. But I can say this at least. America did begin as a Christian nation. You, know, you won't find the mention of Christianity in our founding documents, neither must you be a Christian to hold office in the United States? Uh, so then why have we always heard growing up that America was a Christian nation? Justice David Brewer said the reason we can say this is that Christianity has shaped and molded this country. This is a former Supreme Court justice. Uh, he said that our government, our protection of the minority, our industry, our free market system, our social networks, they're all shaped by Christianity. I gave you a quote last week uh, 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 that is attributed to Alexis de Tocqueville, a French historian and statement that came to the United States. Uh, that it's attributed that he said America is great because America is good. And if America ever loses her goodness, she will lose her greatness. He also said this. He said that the Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it's impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. And with them, this conviction does not spring from that barren traditional faith which seems to vegetate in the soul rather than to live. In other words, it's in their very life. We've heard from the current president. What about prior presidents when they speak of this nation? John Adams uh, said the general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Thomas Jefferson, uh, we would not call him probably a Christian. He was more of a deist. But he, listen to what he said. No nation has ever existed or been governed without religion, nor can be. The Christian religion is the best religion that has been given to man, and I, as chief magistrate of this nation, am bound to give it the sanction of my example. Theodore Roosevelt said the teachings of the Bible are so interwoven and entwined with our whole civic and social life that it would be literally impossible for us to figure to ourselves what life would be if these teachings were removed. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson said America was born a Christian nation. America was born to exemplify that devotion to the elements of righteousness which are derived from the revelations of Holy Scripture. Herbert Hoover said American life is built and it can alone survive upon the fundamental philosophy announced by the Savior 19 centuries ago. Harry Truman said this, is a Christian nation. Then Harry Truman went on to say, uh, it was proven more than half century ago, the declaration was written into the decrees of the highest court of the land. There were Supreme Court rulings that this was a Christian nation back then. Richard Nixon said, let us remember that as a Christian nation, we have a charge and we have a destiny. Article 1, Section 7 of the U.S. Constitution that deals with legislation says that no laws can be signed on Sunday. The reason is that Sunday was viewed as the Christian Sabbath. 
and that everyone was expected to be in church on that day. That's why Thomas Jefferson would make the trip over to the Capitol each and every Sunday to attend church services there. I could go through a long litany of court decisions, laws, public statements that underscore that America has in the past considered herself a Christian nation. 75 to 80 percent of Americans today claim to be Christian. So demogra demographically, America is as Christian as India is Hindu, or Israel is Jewish, as Egypt is Muslim. But the observation of the late Catholic priest Richard Newhouse, it has to be kept in mind. He said of America that it's always been an incorrigibly, confusedly, conflictedly Christian society. That, that Christianity is 3,000 miles wide in America, but it's a half inch deep that people profess to be Christian, but they don't live like Christians. George Barna has probably caught more havoc and grief, but he's been at the cutting or the ragged edge of some uncomfortable research that has been revealed over the past 20 years that people who call themselves Christian today live, the majority of them live and act no differently than those who don't declare to be Christians. It's in a recent LA Times news article. It quoted Barn and other re religious observers. Here's what he said, America Christianity is not well. And there's evidence to indicate that its condition is more critical than most realize or at least want to admit. Every day the church is becoming more like the world it allegedly seeks to change. As offensive as it was to many when the president in Turkey said that, and as offensive as it may be to you tonight, I don't want to offend your sensibilities or your sensitivities, but I think we could all admit in this building, whatever we once were, we are no longer in America. And if you would allow me, I want to open up two stories, two stories in Scripture that I believe point us to how America can get back into the favor of God. I, I believe America is living far short of who she could be. I believe that God has something for America that boggles our minds. But I believe that we've got to become blessable again. That we've lost our, oh, I don't know if this is a word, We've lost our blessability. We are not living under the fount where the glory comes out. We have somehow stepped away from the God who wants to bless this nation very, very much. I, I, I'm not satisfied. I want to see this nation prosper. I want to see churches prosper. I want to see children of the Most High prosper. But more than anything, I want to see us reach this world with the gospel. And that's why it is imperative that America becomes blessable again. That if America has lost any degree of blessability, I want it back. I don't want to live one iota short, one degree off. I don't want to live beneath my privilege I want to see America have a revival that brings back the glory to this nation. Oh, praise God. Oh, praise God. Where did we go wrong? What happened to America? Well, this is the first of two stories I want to tell you. I believe if you want to find out where America went wrong, you need to go back several thousand years and you need to find another empire that went wrong and say, how did it happen? I want to go back to the head of gold in Daniel's vision. I want to go back to the great world empire, the Babylonian empire. And I believe King Nebuchadnezzar could give us a great understanding of what happens when a country goes wrong. This king in Daniel 4 had great visions of God. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples, to all nations, to all languages that dwell. This was a world empire 
This was an empire that stretched around the world to every people, to every nation, every language that dwells on the earth. I'm writing to all of you. Peace be multiplied to you. He said, I'm, I think it's a good thing if I could declare the signs and the wonders of Jehovah God, of El Shaddai, the great Elohim, I want to tell you about the most high God, what he has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonder. His kingdom is the everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Don't you wish sometimes in life the story could just stop right there? What a way to end your life. Go out with a crescendo of glory. But the story does not end. He had a vision of God. He recognized Jehovah. It all started with Daniel and his three friends, uh, uh, the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. Daniel had revealed a forgotten dream, the meaning of the dream. The three Hebrew children refused to bend, refused to bow, refused to go along with the party, were thrown into the fiery furnace, but their lives were spared. And the king realized these are mighty signs and wonders of a king far greater than I. And he began to praise God. He began to magnify God. And that text that we just read shows a little bit of the praise that he had. But in the very next verse, we read that Nebuchadnezzar entered into a time of rest and he languished and luxuriated in all of the blessings that God had bestowed upon his kingdom. It was a time of blessing. It was a time of prosperity. You do know that what the enemy can't do through trials, he will do through complacency. And Nebuchadnezzar, some time passed and he dreamed a second time. He sees a huge tree growing up out of the center of the earth. It reaches the heaven. He sees the trees stretch out all over the earth. It was a blessing to the entire world. And people found rest and security in this gigantic tree who spread its branches across the world. But then a, a command came from heaven, chop it down, lop off its branches, strip its leaves, scatter its fruit to the end of the earth. Leave the stump, leave the roots, until that tree knows there's really only one king in all of the world. King Nebuchadnezzar wakes up. He's troubled. He's disturbed. He calls his astrologers. He calls his wise men to interpret the dream. I probably think they had the answer, but they didn't want to tell him what they thought the answer was to that dream. It was pretty obvious what the answer was, but... You know, discretion is the better part of valor, and they decided to keep their mouth shut. Probably lived another day in the process. He called Daniel. He knew Daniel would tell him the truth, and, and uh, he tells him the dream. And Daniel's face must have reflected what he thought. And he looked at Daniel and he said, Don't let my dream trouble you. And don't you be afraid to tell me what it means. And Daniel said, The tree you saw... That tree you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, which could be seen by all the earth, those leaves that were lovely, that fruit that was abundant, that was food for all, the beast of the field dwelt there, in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home. That tree is you, king. You've grown and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, your dominion to the end of the earth. America, that tree is you. That tree that has brought security to the world. That tree that has brought the answers to the world. That tree has right now in Africa, the AIDS epidemic is plummeting. You know why? because of the United States has invested billions and billions of dollars in Africa. That tree has provided your salvation. That tree, it extended dominion to the earth. But Daniel said, you're about to fall, king, because you don't recognize that it's God that gave you everything you've got. You forgot God in your quest of dominion. 
you've left God out. But Daniel saw something in that stump and in the roots because heaven said, leave the stumps. Leave the stump and leave the roots. Uh, Daniel perceived something. He said, King, it's not too late. King, if you will cry out to God, if you will call to God, he will spare you. Folks, this is where we're at right now. There has been a judgment announced, but oh, I believe if we would cry out to God that this tree can continue to stand and can continue to flourish. But it's going to take a little more than root starter and weed eater. It's going to take a mighty move and reign of the Holy Ghost to keep this nation alive. Oh, praise God. What did the king do? He did nothing. The day went by, nothing happened. The week went by, nothing happened. A month went by, nothing happened. A season came and a season went and nothing happened. And he must have thought, I dodged the bullet. It's not going to happen. A full year passed. God is not slack concerning his promises. And any delay you see in judgment is his long-suffering. It's not that he forgot. It's just not his will that any should perish. A full year went by, and King Nebuchadnezzar was walking around the Capitol Mall. He's walking around and looking at all the monuments. He was checking out Wall Street. He was looking at his kingdom and his might and his power. And he said, Look at what I have done. Sometimes God speaks in a dream. But the moment he said that, a voice came from heaven and said, This day your kingdom will be taken from you. Oh, my. Daniel had warned him. Daniel had told him, It's not too late. If you would just bless God, if you would turn your face to heaven and bless God, oh, praise God. If America, if America, you've got a land of plenty, America, you've been given preservation and might and the security of two oceans uh, to the east and to the west, uh, but America, the day you stop blessing God is the day that the countdown begins uh, to your destruction. Then you're going to stumble. Uh, I believe uh, that there is a creaking and that the fall has begun. The tree's not hit the ground. The impact has not quite yet been felt. I still believe that the tree is swaying, uh, but that a nail-scarred hand uh, could reach up and stop the tree right now. I believe that could happen. Uh, when did it start? If I had to put a finger on a calendar and tell you this is when it all began, I'd have to say that America began to tremble and began to quake and began to shake in the early 60s. America's great schoolmaster for decades was McGuffey. McGuffey readers that cited the Bible and Jesus Christ more than any other sources. But in the early 60s, a woman by the name of Madeline Murray O'Hare began to, her crusade to remove prayer from school. Secularization became the mantra and the religion of that day. Helen Gurley Brown penned the sexual liberation book, Sex and the Single Girl. It was followed in 1967 by the Summer of Love. It began to overturn the sexual mores of this nation. And it began to challenge what is written in this book right here. I believe that God made them Adam and Eve. I believe he wants a man for a woman. I believe that marriage can be, could be, and if we'd stay close to God for life, uh, I believe that God wants our marriage to be a microcosm of his love 
for the world. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I believe that God wants to bless America, but something began to happen in the 60s. What was supposed to have been decided a century prior in the great civil war had suffered from neglect after Lincoln's assassination and the civil rights issue began to come to a peak in the early 60s and the racism and the bigotry and the hatred that spewed from so-called Christians in this world. It is a blight. It is not forgotten. It's in our memories and it's in our histories. Then the assassinations came. JFK, MLK, RFK, Malcolm X. If that wasn't enough, a Vietnam War began. And the tuned in, tuned out, and dropped out drug culture began and America began to fall. And Roe v. Wade took the beauty of childbirth away and 50 million children have been lost since 1973 in the United States. Uh, if the blood of one innocent man Abel cried to God from the ground, there is blood from 50 million children uh, crying out to God uh, right now. And drugs took away our peace uh, and took away our wholesomeness uh, and a sexual revolution destroyed many marriages uh, and divorced Divorce rates began to skyrocket. And then in 1965, Time Magazine came out with their most popular cover, Is God Dead? And they sold more of that magazine than any other Time Magazine. And the foundations of a nation, the quaking and the shaking began. A nation that had forgotten about God continued to sing God bless America, but it meant to Americans, let the good times roll. Let the prosperity continue. Let everything go well. Or as John MacArthur said, one thing is clear. While Americans universally want God's favor as a whole, they don't want God. Give me your favor, but God, I don't want you. I'm going to come back to the story of Nebuchadnezzar, but let's go to the next story. How can America be restored? It's no secret. It's no secret, folks. It's not like Coca-Cola formula locked in a vault in Atlanta somewhere. This is no secret, folks. It is obvious what it will take for America to be restored. The second man I want to talk about was a scribe named Ezra. Israel had been in captivity for many years, commissioned by the king Artaxerxes, Ezra led many captives back to Jerusalem. They rebuilt the temple and tried to reenact the laws of God, but Ezra was appalled. Ezra was appalled by what he found when he arrived in Jerusalem. That, that he got lost. He got lost in trying to fix things. Hear me carefully. It can't be fixed unless the heart changes. We don't need new laws. We need changed lives. Along came Nehemiah. He's going to build the walls. He and Ezra join forces. When the walls are finished, Ezra takes out the book of law. He began to read the five books of Moses. He and those with him, they set up a platform. It's, it's the world's first sermon. And he began to read. And as they read, and the people listened. It's the first time they'd ever heard it. They would stop and explain. They would answer questions. This went on for days and days. For 17 days, Israel would show up in the morning at sunrise. They would worship the Lord, they would bow down, and they would stand and listen to the Word of God. After 17 days of listening to who they should have been and what they should have been doing, you could have knocked those people over with the feather. On the 24th day of that month, they showed up in sackcloth, ashes spread across their face. They came 
they came to the house of God and they stood there in the first quarter of the day. They listened to the word. The second quarter, three hours of the day, uh, they worshiped and prayed. And then at noon, the priest stood on the platform and they began to shout. It was a huge crowd of priests passing it down from voice to voice. When one person would say it, the next person would repeat it so it could reach the crowd. It was said over and over again. Nehemiah 9 and 5, the people were a wreck. They were crying. They were filthy. They were weeping. And here is what they, the, that God wanted said. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and all praise. You want to know what brings revival? Oh, oh, that's what brings revival. And that's what brings the continual blessings uh, to our nation. Let, let's look at the pattern followed here. First, obedience to the Word of God. That's where it starts. Identifying the Word of God as the source of our lives. We're not listening to Dr. Spock. We're not listening to the USA Today polls. We're not listening to everybody else. We're getting our face back into the book of life. Uh, you know, I know that God, uh, that God has a fondness for Israel. I know that he does. And I'm not trying to put Americas in Israel's slot. But I believe that God is no respecter of persons. Uh, and that there are principles of what he says that will apply today. In fact, Psalm 81 11. Uh, he, here is what I believe God would say to America right now if I held a microphone up to him. He said, my people would not heed my voice uh, and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own uh, councils. Oh, America, Oh, America, we've got to get God back into the fabric of our society. He is our only hope. That vain, foolish counsel has brought you down. The second thing, confess known sin. That's what Jerusalem did that day. And then finally, you've got to recommit to God, and you can read for yourself what the recommitments they began to make for God. Would God do this for America? Would he, Brother Gurley? I believe Abraham answers that question. He got God down to ten people. He said, Lord, if there are ten people, righteous people, in those wicked cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, would you spare them for ten righteous people? People, uh, don't you know you're the apple of God's eye? And if God would do it for a wicked city of the plain, uh, how much more would he do it for our nation today? God told Elijah, don't you get discouraged. Listen to me, church. Listen to me. I'm not going through an election season watching the church fretting over what's getting ready to happen. I'm weary of that. Folks, my hope goes far beyond an election. My hope goes far beyond Wall Street. It goes far. My hope is in heaven. It is the anchor of our soul. It's going to keep us. It's going to see us through. God told Elijah, don't you dare crawl under that myrtle tree. Don't you get discouraged and hide in a cave. I have thousands that have not bowed a knee to Baal. Believers, don't you get discouraged hear what the Lord would say. In the 81st Psalm, he goes on, and here's what God says. Even though they were stubborn, even though they wouldn't listen to him, even though that nation turned their back on him, he said, oh, that my people would listen to me. That Israel would walk in my ways. And I would soon subdue, I would subdue those terrorists. 
I would take care of that financial collapse. It, it would be so amazing that even the haters of God would pretend to be submitted to Him. That's the kind of revival I want. He said, because I've got the finest of wheat and I've got honey from the rock that I will satisfy. Oh, America, it is not too late. It is not too late. Musicians, come. I'm almost through. But America, your hope and your help is not going to be found in the empty suits and the talking heads of the media. Your hope and your help is not going to be found in the blogs and the posts and the radio stations and programs and this one and that one and this action committee and that. No. America, your hope and help is not going to be found in vain pursuits of pleasure. It's not going to be found in yourself and it's not going to be found in happy, feel-good religion. You've got to go back to God, America. We have to get back to God. Oh, praise God. I take you back to a field, a field in which the kingdom was taken from him in one day. And the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar, basically, he lost his mind. He went out and ate grass in the field like an animal. His hair began to grow until it looked like eagle's feathers and his hands were like talons. They looked like claws. But after seven passings, what most Bible scholars believe to be seven years, at the end of the time, we're in the same chapter, folks. We're still in the same chapter of Daniel 4. But at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting generation, His kingdom from generation to generation. All of the inhabitants of the earth are as reputed as nothing. He does everything according to His will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain. I said no one can restrain. I said no one. No one. I said no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? But listen to this. At the same time that I bless the Lord, at the same time, I honored God. My reason returned to me and the glory of my kingdom and my honor and splendor returned. My counselors, my nobles returned. I was restored to my kingdom and the excellent majesty was added to me. America, if you will bless God, there can be a restoration that comes back to you. Can we stand all over this house? I, I began with the quote of a president. No longer a Christian nation, or no longer just a Christian nation. I thank God I'm in a nation where people can worship as they please. I thank God for that. But let me just say this. If indeed, if indeed, we have lost one spoke of light in that glorious halo of the blessings that God wants to give. If indeed America has become colder in God and if indeed Hollywood not only leads but reflects who we have become as a people, then I say this. Get ready, America. Because when the night seems the darkest, God has a habit of showing up. 
there shall be light in the evening time. I, the whole time I've been up here talking, I've just been fighting saying something, and I, I just feel like I need to say this. Brother Barnes was in Houston preaching a few years ago. And Brother Barnes said he had had a vision. And in that vision, he said, I saw a comet streak across the sky and I saw gifts falling all across America. And he said, I perceived that I was living just before the coming of the Lord. And he said, I saw that comet land in Houston and I saw fire spread out all across America. And a voice spoke to me and said, this is the revival that I will send to America just before I return. Folks, he's not come back yet. He's not come back yet. I believe America has one last revival. It's downtown in Market Square, a young man, a young man who had been en route to Azusa to, wanted to experience the Holy Ghost. He, he heard somewhere around Oklahoma that the Holy Ghost was falling down here. He turned south, came down to Houston, was in the first Bible college, Pentecostal Bible College in Houston, and run by D.C.O. Opperman in Old Market Square. Years 1907-1909. One night, they had been up praying, the class had been praying, and he went to a room, to a window in his room, and he looked out, and he said, I saw the biggest angel coming through the sky, growing larger and larger. I saw gifts like diamonds falling out of its arm. And I saw that angel plant its feet a half mile from where I was. And I saw the demonic hordes leave the city of Houston. And a revival began that stretched around the world. Folks, Pastor Charles got up last Wednesday night when he was praying. And he said, he quoted 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people which are called by my name. Listen, folks, listen. It didn't say, if all of America will call on my name. It didn't say, if everybody, if everybody from the Great Lakes down to Florida, if everybody from the Poconos out to San Diego, would get on their face. It said, if my people, if my people, which are, it doesn't even take everybody that calls themselves Christian in America. Those who are called by my name, if that group of people will get on their face and will cry out to God, I will heal that land. Oh, Oh, do you feel like praying in this building right now? I, I just dim the lights and musicians, praise singers, whatever you feel. Uh, but I feel like a Second Chronicles seven fourteen experience uh, should sweep over us right now. And we should begin to bless the Lord in this house. Uh, and we should begin to cry out to God. Uh, I wish you'd come. I wish you'd find yourself a place to pray. And I wish you would pray, God, America needs you. I'm not praying for a new car right now. I'm not praying for a better job right now. I'm not even praying, God, uh, for a closer walk. Uh, I'm not praying for greater goosebumps. Uh, are a thrill in you, Lord. I'm not praying for a new revelation. I am praying. I am interceding. I am crying out for this people and for this land. God, send that revival to America. Send us that revival. Oh, hallelujah to your name. Hallelujah. Father, heal your world from my 
Let's lift our voices across this building right now. Mm. power in your prayer right now. There's power in your prayer. Right now across this building, I, I, let's get specific in our prayers. I wish you would begin to pray right now for Capitol Hill, begin to pray for our congressmen, for our senators. Would you begin to pray for the White House uh, right now? Would you begin to pray? 
would you begin to pray, right? Just call every congressman that you can think their name right now, the senators that you can think their name, every leader in the federal level right now. Let's pray for America, right? Let's don't pray for the city of Pearland or the state of Texas. Let's pray for this nation right now. Let's pray for those that are in seats of power and authority. Oh, in the name of the Lord. You can awaken, you can disturb in the night hours, God. You can whisper wisdom, Lord. You can break the cycles up there, Lord. Oh, God, we need revival, Lord. Let revival spring out. Let it break forth, oh, God. Let it flow down Wall Street right now, God. Let it flow, let it flow right now in the Federal Reserve, God. Let it flow through the stock exchanges, Lord. Uh, in the name of Jesus, uh, we need the flowing. Uh, we need the flowing of the Holy Ghost, God, uh, from every hamlet, every village, Lord, uh, across our country, God. Uh, oh, Lord, would you disturb and perturb every child of God in this country, God. Would you wake them up, Lord, uh, with a spirit of travail uh, that they might intercede, uh, that they they might call out for you, oh God. Oh Lord, let those stayed and those formal churches, God, let them fall like wheat to the floor with travail and intercession, oh God. Oh, would you baptize the pulpits of America with fearless preachers, God? Would you get the smiles off of their faces and the saccharine sweetness out of their voices? And would you let them lift their voices like a trumpet uh, and declare this is the way of the Lord. Uh, oh God, would you turn our churches uh, into, into fire, God. Uh, would you set them on fire and make them a flame? Uh, oh Lord, uh, would there be a conflagration of the Holy Ghost uh, in our nation? Uh, would there be a power of, uh, would miracles break forth uh, on every street corner? Uh, would lie be remarkably transformed. Oh God, we need that kind of revival. America needs that kind of revival. Oh God. Ooh, hallelujah, hallelujah. If my people, you're the people, you're the people of God. We cry out to you, Lord. We claim that promise. It is ours. You will heal our land. You will work miracles in our land. Ooh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Oh. Oh.
Ha <laughs> God, it's up to you, Lord. It's up to you. Our help and hope is in you, God. Our help and hope is in you, Lord. I feel the rain of your love. I feel the wind of your spirit. Now the heartbeat of it. Let us hear. I touch, I touch. God, it's what you want to do. It's what you desire to do, God. Mm-hmm. 
Take the hand of someone next to you, just lift it in the air. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room right now. We've heard from the Lord. We've heard from the Lord. Uh, What a promise. (laughs) What a promise to us as a people. What a promise to our nation. Uh, I believe it. I receive it. I declare it. I decree it uh, right now, God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Receive that promise into your heart right now. Do you receive that? It may look like the enemies gained a momentary victory in the spiritual realm of America. It may look like people are falling away. It may look like people are getting cold in the Lord. But oh, oh, I know. I know when that last revival comes. And I feel, I feel that we're wading into it right now. I feel it. I feel it. Oh, I sense it. Mm. 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 Let the headlines not be a Muslim uprising. Let the headlines be that the apostolics have broken through and miracles are taking place. Signs and wonders are coming across our world. Oh, I believe it, folks. With God, there's nothing impossible. Amen, amen. Praise God. I want you to go in the love of the Lord, go in grace. Looking forward, um, let me mention this Sunday morning, Sunday night. We have, I, 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 I believe, one of the greatest greatest men and uh, in our movement and uh, he is taking time away from his church to come and bless this church I want you to bring people by the droves that have needs because we are going to see miracles Sunday morning and Sunday night and brother Brian Kinsey is going to be with us bring somebody to the house of the Lord and I believe we're going to see great great things get around one to another O oh, people of God, let's heal this land. Let's bless the Lord. Amen, amen, amen.